uh, keys, the uh, pew pad, the pew pads at the end of the pews, the attendance pads. If you would sign in, let us know that you are here. We would appreciate that. And we do have a few announcements. Um, let's see. First of all, our dress a girl is uh, this Tuesday, and that begins from 9:30 to noon. Christian Ed also is on Tuesday, and that is at seven. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, February 22nd, the prayer group, and that is at 11 a.m. And then we have um, the backpack program. Uh, to, do you want her to speak? Uh, I, Lori has an announcement. Um, do you want to go ahead and do that first, and then we'll continue? Good morning. Um, the Weekend Backpack Program um, is in need of food. Um, there is a picture up on the board, and um, the, we are challenging the west side of the church by the stained glass windows <laughs> versus the right side. Oh, so <laughs> what did I say? For oh, just a minute. <laughs> oh. Well, sorry. <laughs> um, there'll be a, there is a, a table in the back with the uh, items on it. Um, we um, we'll always accept uh, money donations. If you do have a money donation, you could um, um, just put it on an envelope and write um, backpack. Um, we have been doing this backpack for a couple years, and um, we will continue to do it as long as we need to. We give out um, 15 backpacks, 10 of them go to the high school and middle school, and five of them go to the elementary school. Um, we also do give out um, fresh fruit. We go to the store and get fresh fruit when we give out the backpacks. Um, also, um, on the screen, you can see our rows up there with doing her mentoring, reading program. Um, uh, please consider um, volunteering for the school um, and help the youngsters uh, either contact myself or Diane. Um, I, I don't do the reading program, but I work with the first grade children um, with Mrs. Schultz, and uh, she um, needs help with their children while she's maybe doing something else and a little child needs help with their writing sentences or whatever. And, um, you know, they always need, need help. So, um, thank you. This is my left, this is my right. <laughs> All right, and Ash Wednesday service is at 7 p.m., and that's this Wednesday, February 22nd. And then our journey to Jerusalem. We have um, one chapter in the Bible equals one mile in virtual, and so far we've gone 988 miles. And I put some miles in there, so we've gone a little further, but as of now, 988 miles. And now we have, um, this is for the worship committee. There is going to be a worship committee meeting Tuesday at 11 a.m., and Nancy has an announcement she's ready to make. Here to shout it out. Congratulations to all of you. The Valentine's Day party brought in $908. Oh, wow. And um, this is the cake walk brought in 197 The wrap ticket is 71 Donations and auction the rest. You can congratulate yourself. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. God said, This is my son, the beloved. God said, Listen. God said, Do not be afraid. And after all this was spoken, God was quiet. Fill our souls, quiet our minds, and prepare us to be transformed. O God. Amen. Our opening hymn is Open Our Eyes, Lord. Um, but they all get together and you know, 
having fun and maybe you meet somebody new. My dad's side of my family is planning a reunion this week with cousins who have never met each other and some of us who know each other but have never been in the same place all together before. So we're looking forward to that. I've got a couple of family pictures here. This is eight of my 21 cousins on my mom's side. And my mom and her two brothers who are both just a little bit younger than she is. We work together in Florida. And so we have family reunions quite often. Today we're going to talk about the transfiguration. That's a long word that means Jesus went up a mountain with uh, Peter and James and John, a couple of his disciples, and they saw him change. He changed the way he looks, and all of a sudden Moses, who had lived long, long, long time before, and Elijah, who was a prophet that again lived long before Jesus, were show, showed up right there with him. It was like a family reunion. It kind of brought all of their history together to have those three appear together uh, in front of them. And they were never quite the same again. Our families, when we get together and learn about them and learn about our history and some of the things people in our family have done, it changes us for the better. It, it strengthens us. It gives us some new encouragement. Uh, it inspires maybe things we'd like to do that others in our family have done. And this was a very special family reunion. Let's have a break. And Lord, we thank you for families, for those who support us, for those who teach us, for those who have followed you and taught us to do the same, who love us and will listen when we need them and who give us a chance to do the same for them. We ask that you'd uh, help us to know, yes, our families that include our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, but also our place in your family as we are part of the church and become brothers and sisters in you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've come to our time of a ministry of prayer, and for the second week in a row, we can give thanks for a nice sized group of kids that are with us this morning, including our littlest one, who I saw as I was coming in, who's not with that group of kids. <laughs> uh, and all of us being present as children of God. Um, I sent through the prayer chain yesterday a request for prayer for my best friend, whose name is Brenda Moyer, and she has had issues with nutrient levels in her blood fluctuate, and they just bottom out, and various things happen, and now she's in the hospital with what they suspect is a heart issue that might be related to some of the issues she's been having, uh, and I don't have an update since yesterday, but she appreciates your prayers. Uh, the written ones praying for God's grace to cover Lansing and the Spartan nation with peace, comfort, and love. Yeah, as I'm pretty sure everyone listening knows that we're just shooting at uh, Michigan State this week. That one hits really close to home for us. Uh, so, yeah, do keep that population in your prayers. God bless the worship committee. Last Sunday's event was fun, and Mary's pecan pie is the best. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, thank you for that. And we, as you were unable to hear Nancy, we raised over $900, um, mostly from the auction, but over $100 on, on each of the other activities, too. Um, happy birthday to Dolores. Birthday was yesterday. 90... 92, is that what you said? 93, okay. So happy birthday. 
one for Laura as she has to move from her apartment. So, um, and Dwayne Crow had cataract surgery tomorrow. Olive, this is our little three-year-old who has leukemia, is back in the hospital. She's been doing better, but is having some issues again. And those are the written ones. And let's pray together. And God of grace, we thank you for your invitation to be in your presence. A presence I pray we all find within these walls or through virtual means as we gather together this day. We do pray your grace upon um, the Michigan State community in Lansing and all of those who have who have done shootings and harm to others, who have been victims, who are part of uh, communities that have been affected. And we ask that you would offer forgiveness, but offer peace to hurting hearts and your help in recovery and rebuilding after such events, as well as your healing for those who have been hurt in so many ways. We thank you for Dolores and for birthdays and milestones that you provide in our lives that bring us so much joy. And Lord, we ask for your presence to be made known to Laura as she faces a move and all of the, the stress that can go with that, we ask that you guide her to the right new setting and be with her as she gets settled. We ask that you make your presence known to Dwayne in uh, the healing procedure that he will have tomorrow. Be with the doctors that it may be your work done through their hands. And Lord, we thank you for the improvement that Olive had made and for your presence that we know has been with her in this time of illness. And we ask that you make your presence known in a special way as she finds herself back in need of um, care by the doctors in the hospital. And Lord, make your healing presence known to Brenda as well. She has strong faith in you and has experienced your healing and your presence in powerful ways in the past, and we know that you will provide that same presence in her time of illness now. And as we are together this day, help us to see and hear and follow you in any way that you show yourself, through your word as it is shared, through the songs that we sing, through the assurance that you hear our prayers, whether or not they are spoken, and that we are ready to answer your call as we go from this place. That we might experience a mountaintop moment here as we are together, and as we return to life that can be full of valleys, may we take with us all that we learn and all that we gain in our spiritual lives. And all of this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let's stand together as we're able at the same number of times.
comes from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, and Jesus has been uh, foretelling his death and talking about carrying the cross and uh, denying ourselves as it is appropriate, and this is six days after those conversations. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. A poem called The Mountain by Robert Frost uses a conversation between a narrator and another man to tell the story of someone who worked around the base of a mountain. He told the narrator about a beautiful view from the top of the mountain and about a brook that flowed from somewhere near the top with warm water in the winter and cold in the summer. The thing is, the man had never climbed the mountain himself. He had only heard of its beauty and majesty secondhand. The mountaintop sounds like a beautiful place. From the bottom, he only saw the mountain as something that was in the way, something that cast a shadow on the town and took up space. Kind of sad, isn't it, to hear how someone capable of climbing and interested in the sights who never makes the trek up the mountain to experience it himself. Do we sometimes do the same with regard to mountaintop experiences with God? Do we hang around the bottom of the mountain knowing the law and its limitations, listening to other people's stories, maybe sermons, reading devotionals, watching how other people's situations turn out, but rarely, if ever, find ourselves on a mountaintop with God? Hearing spiritual stories from others and knowing their experience can inspire us. I told you at the welcome party about a book, Rush of Heaven, and someone has just borrowed it from me, so I won't say any more than And a true story, the woman is still living, who faced a devastating injury. She was treated poorly by those who were intended to care for her. And then Jesus showed up to her one-on-one, and her healing was amazing. I was inspired by her story, but she experienced God and Jesus in her experience herself. As I had experienced healing from God for myself, though my story was in ways that looked like everyday medical treatment and things like that. Experiencing God's presence ourselves takes a willingness to take the hike up the mountain ourselves. During the season of Lent, we'll talk more about some of the steps on this hike that I'm calling us to take. Today, I'd like to go over just kind of a general itinerary, pointing out prayer, scripture reading, worship, and spiritual friendships as some of the steps toward God. First, 
and throughout our heart, our height, we need to pray. A good start is to thank God for meals and our blessings, to touch base with God in the morning and at night, to scream for help when we're in trouble and request what we want or need. But more than that, we come closer to God when we practice a kind of patient, contemplative prayer that is more watchful waiting than conscious thought, more silence than speech. Prayer that requires blocking out time and investing energy in our relationship with God. Second, the map and guidebook for our hike is God's word. So to encounter God, we need to follow its directions, meaning we need to read our Bibles, like we're practicing for our journey to Jerusalem. And we are about a sixth of the way there, which is a good place considering we have six weeks till Easter. We have 6,000 and some miles to get there, and we are right at about 1,000 miles. Reading or listening on our own and studying with others enrich our spiritual lives in different ways. Since we've been doing this journey to Bethlehem, I've been talking about different genres or different types of literature in the Bible, and today we looked at a gospel. The gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the good news of Jesus from different perspectives. The word gospel means good news. Matthew, the gospel where I read the mountaintop experience of the disciples, is the most Jewish of the gospels. It's written for a Jewish audience to convince them that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Matthew is the only gospel that makes direct reference to the church. In chapter 16, 18, Simon is called Peter, the rock on which the church will be built. And in chapter 18, verse 17, Jesus talks about dealing with someone who has sinned, especially the sinned against you, if they don't respond to reason when one or two approach them, then you take the issue and them to the church. The gospel is divided into five divisions with the addition of intro and conclusion. And each of those sections, if you're reading through Matthew, like I suggested for our um, journey to Bethlehem, if you started with Matthew, um, look for the words, when Jesus had finished saying these things, that's the end of one of those five divisions. There are several ways to take your scripture reading beyond just seeing the words on the page or hearing them. Try reading short passages multiple times. Of course, we're talking chapters for our journey to Jerusalem, so that's important to get a feel for the story. But you can also read short passages and read them multiple times. One suggestion, the first time, just read the passage as you would anything else. Get a feel for what it says. Then read and mark words that stand out to you. Meditate for a few moments on those words, and meditation simply means keep one topic in your mind and continue to think about it. Okay? So meditate for a few moments on the words that have stood out to you in your second reading. Read again and prayerfully ask God what he would like you to do in response to those words. Why is he pointing them out to you? Then pray, committing to do as you've discerned God has asked. And then maybe keep that verse, in, that verse or that short passage in front of you so that you're inclined to see those words on a regular basis until you get a sense that whatever God has asked of you is kind of resolved. This is a variation of an ancient practice called Lectio Divina. Journaling in kind of a traditional sense, writing down what you're feeling, what questions you have, those kind of things, can help you process what you read. If it left you with questions, write those down. If you learn something new, jot it down. Bible journaling can do so with a creative twist. And if you're interested in trying some Bible journaling, I have a friend who leads Bible journaling online. 
So get with me and I can get you in touch with her if you'd like to uh, take part in that. Dedicating time to reading or listening to the words of the Bible regularly, even if you've read it from beginning to end, maybe even more than once, keeps you in touch with God's comfort, correction, and calling all along the spiritual journey. Our third step for today is to attend worship regularly. You're on that path if you are within the sound of my voice today. You won't necessarily sense the presence of God in any unusual, extraordinary way with every sermon, every song, or even every service. And on kind of the flip side of the coin, God can certainly show up when you are alone, at home, through someone on TV, in your fishing boat. That was what my dad used to say. He said, I can encounter God in my fishing boat. Um, so in your fishing boat, at your campsite, or maybe through music on your playlist, among other things. But we make the most progress on our spiritual journeys when we find a healthy balance between alone time and gathering with others for fellowship, support, inspiration, and accountability. We and our church family can provide such blessings for each other. Sometimes we experience the blessings of fellowship, etc., in worship among the full church family, a setting much like this morning. Other times we need the spiritual intimacy of a small group or one-on-one -on -one sharing. We all need those few people who know us, who listen to us, who keep our confidences, who keep us honest, holding us accountable, who influence us in the best ways, and who know we will do the same for them. Even Jesus and his first disciples needed each other. When Jesus went up the mountain where he was transfigured, he took with him Peter, James, and John, his three closest friends, telling them not to tell anyone about what they've seen until they, he had been raised from the dead, and also making it clear through the voice of God that spoke to them that this was not a moment to be held on to. This was something that was for the good of their lives going forward. Still other times we need to change things up a little. Along with regular worship attendance with our church family, we can attend things like retreats, revivals, spiritual growth opportunities. Those can enhance our overall experience of corporate worship. When Jesus, Peter, James, and John reached the top of the mountain, they saw something totally unexpected. Not a bubbling stream whose water seemed to run cool in the summer and hot in the winter, but Jesus, transfigured, changed in front of them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. In addition, suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. As if the transformation of Jesus' appearance wasn't enough, Moses and Elijah, the two greatest prophets of Israel, show up along with him. As spectacular as that experience is, it takes a while for Peter and the others to get the point as Peter says to him, Lord, it's good for us to be here, and if you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter, like so many of us, is overworking a bit, overfunctioning, barely taking a second to stop and catch his breath and take in what is happening before his eyes. When we've taken the steps to climb closer to God, like Peter, we might want to hold on to those mountaintop moments when we feel God closest to us. But the benefit of those moments is not just in the seeing and hearing and feeling. It's in the fact 
that those moments strengthen us. They clarify God's call. They transform our hearts to make us more like Jesus every day. And they empower us for real life, even when real life take us, takes us into some of the deepest valleys. We can't force spiritual experiences, nor can we determine when and where God will or will not show up and make his presence known in extraordinary ways. But through the ordinary spiritual disciplines of things like prayer and scripture reading, worship, and time with small groups or one-on-one -on -one with supportive friends, we can ascend the spiritual mountain. We can open our hearts to whatever God chooses to do in and around and through us. God gives us plenty of opportunities to meet him on the mountaintop and to be transformed. Don't just hang around the base of the mountain hearing the stories. Spend time in prayer, scripture reading, worship, and spiritual friendships, among other things. These are the steps of climbing to where God can show you the view that he wants you to see in his glory, where he wants you to see him in all of his glory, not just hearing about it secondhand, but seeing it firsthand. And let us pray. And God of glory, we thank you for those mountaintop moments when we know in our hearts and feel in our bodies your presence. Those moments when we know beyond a shadow of a doubt our healing has come from you. Our thoughts of where life might be taking us next are your call and not just our own ideas. Those times when we hear you speaking to us and know that whatever's happening in life is going to work out. We also thank you that those moments are meant to stick with us in special ways, but in our everyday lives, in the valleys, in the mundane schedule of our daily lives. We thank you that you make your presence known in extraordinary ways, sometimes to us alone and sometimes within our groups of worship and prayer. Meet us where we are. Call us to the mountaintop so that we might see and reflect your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. in honor of all that God does for us, let's share our tithes and offerings for this morning.
source of life. Receive the gifts we offer and let all our service, inspired by the breath of life, give you glory and praise. In the name of the word of life. Amen. intended to share just before the offering that we have a very nice thank you card from Lily Bixby who received some money from it was either Westerman or endowment for living expenses while she's putting herself through school so um, thank you for your contributions to our general fund that allow for the Westerman and endowment and some of those special funds to do that kind of work and now hear these words of benediction we will one day have a front row seat from which to behold Christ's glory. For now we live in the already and the not yet, with his kingdom breaking forth, though not always fully in view. Go this week and be agents of that kingdom, living in the hope and power of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Amen. Amen.